All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to day two of our conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Derek Wall. Uh, and so why was an income app, but I haven't checked it out. Uh, Darren's going to speak today about farming the rural economy in the past, present, and future. And he farmed with his family in the 1980s and 90s, so just outside of Saskatoon and Dunder, just south of here. From 1996 to 2010, he served as the Executive Secretary and Director of Research for the National Farmers Union. While there, he wrote several influence reports, including the structural adjustment of Canadian agriculture and farm prices in corporate power. He's played a central role in many successful campaigns, including a multi-organizational effort to stop the introduction of a genetically modified wheat in North America. In recent years, he's returned to university and has completed two additional degrees. as a BSc in biology and a BA in history, interesting combination, and also a BA in political science. And he's uh, co-authored a number of journal articles on farmland ownership and has a forthcoming article on the loss of young farmers from Canadian culture. He's currently working to publish a book on energy and material flows in traditional and modern civilizations, and is still also working with the National Farmers Union to develop a roadmap to help Canadian farmers reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the farms by half in the coming decades. He is also uh, lives where he speaks. He has a solar panel array at his real home in the shopping for electric car. We'll find out if he's, if he's made a purchase yet. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Darren Ballman. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming to listen to me today. I am extremely honored to be addressing you at your 30th annual national convention. And I'm especially interested because of your theme this year, and that is health and shared prosperity. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about shared prosperity. Or more precisely, perhaps the sharing and prosperity of rural Canada, and I want to I want to address a question, and that is, is prosperity being equitably shared, or perhaps as an alternative, are some powerful players in the system taking a larger and larger share of that prosperity and leaving less for rural people, rural communities, and farmers? Uh, uh, my talk has five parts. I'm going to start by talking about agricultural input use. And I'm going to focus on the ever increasing dependence of farmers on farm inputs. Uh, we're, we're really creating a high input model of agriculture. Then I'm going to talk about the effect that that high input model of agriculture has on farm income. I'm going to shift to talking about greenhouse gas emissions from high input agriculture. And I'm going to make the case that the kind of biophysical limits that we are set to encounter in the climate systems really pose a problem for continuing the model of agriculture we have. Uh, you know, talk about the climate emergency and the limits to greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and other parts of the system and society. And I'm going to end by talking about solutions. I'm going to specifically talk about low input agriculture as a solution, not just to the farm income problem and the extraction of wealth from rural Canada, but also as a solution to the climate crisis that we're facing. So uh, let me just start off our one of five agricultural input use. And I'll start by pointing out that 2018 is an important centennial. 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the start of the transition to high input agriculture. Uh, the graph that you see in front of you is a graph of the number of tractors and horses in Canada from 1910 to 1980. So this is playing a little bit about the graph, that blue line that goes up, that's the number of tractors in Canada starting in 1910 going to 1980. And that brown line that peaks and then comes down is the number of horses. Uh, the units aren't important in this graph or in any other ones. Uh, don't squint to try and figure out if these are thousands or millions. Uh, what's important is just the shape of those lines. Uh, so you'll see that, that uh, tractor numbers take off in the first part of the century course the peak and then come down. And I just want you to know the red triangle in the lower left. That red triangle marks 1918. Things really started to change in 1918. If you'll notice the number of tractors is fairly flat to 1918 and then it flat sharply up. It wasn't that there wasn't tractors 
much before 1918. There were, but there were the really big steam tractors. You now see if you went to the uh, Western Development Museum, where you'll see them there. And they were really just too big and heavy and expensive for the kind of farms we had in uh, Canada at the beginning of the 20th century, a quarter section or two quarters out here in the West, uh, smaller in central and eastern Canada. So farmers really couldn't make use of those tractors on the kinds of farms they had in the beginning of the 20th century. So before 1918, there really wasn't a lot of farms that had tractors, but that changed uh, at the end of the Second World War. Three things came together, three factors. First, uh, this, the First World War caused a labor shortage, so people really became interested in anything that would allow them to produce food with less labor, so they started turning toward tractors. Second, the First World War created significant industrial capacity, a lot of factories that could produce uh, internal combustion engines and work with steel and iron. And third, it was a, the introduction of a whole new generation of tractors, smaller, lighter, cheaper tractors that made sense of the kind of farms that we had here in, in Canada. Uh, and here's a, a graph too of the US, show you that it looks about the same uh, flat line until 1918, and then it really takes off. So why am I talking about tractors? Because with the coming of the tractor, something changed. Something really historic happened on our farms. For thousands of years, farmers farmed and they were not dependent on purchased inputs. With the coming of the tractor for the first time in history, farmers became dependent on buying something year after year, season after season, month after month. They had to buy petroleum. Until 1918, virtually everything that went into farming came out of the farm. Farms produced their own energy supply, they produced their own seeds, they, they produced their own fertility. But when they started buying tractors, suddenly they became dependent on purchasing petroleum year after year. Until 1918, the energy supply for the farm really was the farm itself. It was the grain and hay and grass that grew on the farm, the farm power itself. But after 1918, the power source for farming would no longer be the farm fields, but the distant oil fields. So that's the first thing I want to I want to get you to think about, and that is this really historic change in 1918, and that has really played out over the last 100 years, the adoption of a wholly new model of food production, and that is high input food production. Uh, I just want to get at this one other way. Uh, this is a picture taken uh, where I live, just a half an hour south of Saskatoon. Uh, that barn in the background, I, I painted that one year. Let's try that again. Um, that barn was finished in 1918, and it was built not to house dairy cattle or beef cattle or cattle of any kind or pigs. It was built to house draft horses. So you'll immediately realize that that barn was finished just in time to be obsolete by the coming of the tractor. And uh, the man who had it built, Mr. Rystrom, I, I knew his son, uh, he had bad timing in two ways. Uh, he finished the barn in time for it to be obsolete, but he was also killed in the Spanish flu epidemic. 1918, following the First World War, just as that barn was, was finished. So it never really got used for its intended purpose. So what's the symbolism of that barn? Well, humans have practiced agriculture for about 10,000 years. And for 9,900 of those years, about 99% of the time, agriculture was solar powered, low energy, low input, and more or less zero net emission. And I would suggest that that barn represents the, the end stage, the final phase of those 9,900 years of solar powered, low input, low emission agriculture. That ended around 1918 when that barn was finished. And I would further suggest that those solar panels in the foreground represent, if not the new era of solar powered, low input, low emission agriculture, at least the dawning of the possibility of a new era of solar powered low input, low emission agriculture. Um, so just to stay, uh, I'll get to that new era in a minute when we talk about solutions, but I just want to stay right now on this idea of farmers moving into a regime of ever higher input use. This is a graph of Saskatchewan fertilizer use over the last 50 years, 1968 to 2018. 
Thank you for fertilizing use in Saskatchewan. Uh, the tremendous increase is really apparent. Farmers have doubled the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that they use just since uh, 2006, and they've quadrupled since 1994. A tremendous increase in dependence on nitrogen fertilizer, which is really one of the key feedstocks in agriculture. Sometimes representatives from our governments and elsewhere tell us that in this new era, zero chill, uh, agriculture, direct seeding, farmers are using fewer and fewer inputs. Nobody has looked at the data believes that. So what I'm getting at here is that, you know, just a summary of this first part, starting in 1918 and accelerating over the past 100 years, farmers have become increasingly dependent on a whole range of farm inputs, purchased farm inputs, on fossil fuels for pulling power and other uses, on fertilizers made from fossil fuels, on petrochemical pesticides, and on plastics, antibiotics, uh, purchased feed additives, high-tech seeds, and a whole range of farm inputs. So I want to turn now and look at how that's affected our farms, how it's affected their incomes, and thus how it's affected the rural economy and the prospects for rural revitalization. This is a graph of farmers' gross farm revenues, their net farm income. Uh, it covers about 90 years, uh, 1926 to 2017, for all of Canada. So the black line that goes up is farmers' revenue. That's the money they get when they sell grains, oil seeds, crops, livestock, etc. And that gray line is their net farm income. That's the money they have left after they pay the bill. So I'm just going to add in some color so you can see this a little more clearly. I'm going to add a, a red line that will show you where zero is. And now I'm going to color in the net farm income portion of this graph so you can really see what's happened over the last almost 100 years in terms of net farm income. I'm going to color in the years of positive net income in green and the years of negative net income in red. So you can really see what's happened over the last 100 years in terms of net income. Uh, on the left, you see that uh, that's the Great Depression. And then you see a uh, fairly good net farm income through the 1940s. 50s, 60s, and the first half, well, the 70s and first half of the 80s. And then that income falls to more or less zero. And it stays there through the latter half of the 80s. Then in the 90s, it goes negative. Net farm income's recovered a little bit in recent years, but the recovery is fairly modest. And some of us worry that it might also be temporary. But now I want to color in the area between those two lines. I'm going to color that in in blue so you can really see it. That blue area is the difference between what farmers get when they sell their crops and livestock and other products and what they have left after they pay their bills. That blue area is equal to farmers' costs. It's what they pay for fuels and fertilizer and chemicals and machinery parts and interest on debt, all of those costs. Now remember I said that farmers are becoming more dependent on purchased inputs. You can see it there. You can see that a larger and larger share of their money is going to pay for those farm inputs. That blue area, that's the money that is captured by Bayer Monsanto, by Nutrien, which is Agri of the Potash Corp, by the Royal Bank of Canada, by John Deere when they sell parts. Uh, you can see that that amount of money that is being extracted from the farm level, that blue area just gets wider and wider and wider and consumes more and more of farmer's revenue. So let's put some numbers up for this. Uh, from the end of the Second World War, 1945, until the end of the, um, the 70s, the share that was going to agribusiness input sellers was about 59%. 59%. If you add it up since 1985, the share that's gone to those transnational corporations that sell farm inputs is 98%. What's happened in the era of culture is that the dominant global transnational agribusiness corporations have restructured the system to make themselves the primary beneficiaries of the food system wealth produced in rural Canada. This is a story of tremendous wealth extraction. And this wealth extraction has had some really negative effects on the farm community in rural Canada. This high input model that set the stage for so much wealth extraction 
Uh, it's causing on again, off again farm income crisis since the mid 1980s. It's pushed uh, nearly a third of Canadian farm families off the land just since 1991. It's pushed two thirds of young farmers off the land since 91. So if you think about farmers under the age of 35, and if you look at the stats can numbers in 91, if you look at them now, there's only a third as many now as there was. Canadian agriculture risks plunging off a demographic cliff unless we can get those young farmers back there. Um, we've got record high farm debt. It just uh, crossed into a hundred billion dollars this year. And uh, not on this slide, but I'll tell you also, if you add up all the money that taxpayers had to transfer to farm families since 1985 through farm support programs, that number is also over a hundred billion. So tremendous amounts of money had to be transferred from non-farmers to farmers to keep the system going. And if you add up the excess wealth extraction, uh, if you sort of think about that 51, 59% share that the corporation was taking through the 1970s, and if, you, if they would have maintained that share rather than taking 98%, they would have extracted $500 billion less. So that shift from the extraction of about 50 Nine percent of farm revenue to ninety-eight percent. That means those corporations captured an extra five hundred billion dollars. Imagine what would happen, or what would have happened, if that half billion dollars would have remained in the world of Canada. So, just uh, just to expand the point a little bit, the problem here is wealth extraction, and it's not just in agriculture. It's in potash. It's in oil and gas. It's in uranium. And I would humbly suggest that any sincere effort toward rural revitalization must take into account corporate power and wealth extraction. We can do a lot of good things, we can do a lot of positive things, but unless we curb and control and discipline the powerfully dominant corporations to suck the wealth produced in rural Canada out of rural areas and often right out of the country, we're going to be impeded in our efforts toward real rural revitalization. So that's the high input agriculture model. It has two really negative effects. One, it leaves farms and rural areas with less and less wealth. But two, it's a tremendously high emission system. That all of those farm inputs going in one end of the system lead to very high greenhouse gas emissions out the other end. So I'm going to talk about greenhouse gas emissions because I want to show that that system that I just outlined the high input model is actually going to have to end here very soon. So I showed you this before. This is nitrogen fertilizer use in Saskatchewan. It's quadruple since 1991. Uh, nitrogen fertilizer is a fossil fuel product. If you went to a big nitrogen fertilizer facility, and I'll show you one in the next slide, you would essentially see a big natural gas pipe going in one end, and there's a big facility in the middle, and then out the other end comes a nitrogen gas pipe, and they turn that nitrogen gas, which is called a hydrous ammonia, they turn that into all the granular fertilizers farmers use. So nitrogen fertilizer, one of the most critical feedstocks in modern agriculture, really is a fossil fuel product. Natural gas goes in, nitrogen fertilizer comes out. And it is so energy intensive that the energy needed to produce and transport and apply one ton of nitrogen fertilizer is equivalent to two tons of gasoline. That's a, a nitrogen fertilizer factory. I took that picture when I was in Brandon, Manitoba this past winter uh, speaking. Uh, that is the Koch brothers nitrogen plant. And yes, those Koch brothers. Uh, you're looking at the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in Manitoba. The production of nitrogen fertilizer is tremendously productive of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, in this case, that would be carbon dioxide, but then when farmers apply it, you get a lot of nitrogen dioxide. So just to give you a little detail of the emissions from agriculture, this is uh, Canadian greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture from 1990 to 2016, so about the last 25, 26 years. Uh, there's a lot of detail there. Don't, don't worry about the detail. I just want you to notice couple of things about this graph. Uh, first, emissions from Canadian agriculture are going up. And uh, the second thing I'll tell you is 
emissions from Canadian agriculture are very high. They're about 12% uh, of total Canadian emissions, that's just for agriculture. If you add up the rest of the food system, the transport, processing, packaging, refrigeration, preparation, etc., uh, it gets up to 20 to 25%. So emissions from the food system are about equal to all the road transport emissions in Canada, the emissions from all the cars and trucks. So this is not a small piece of the puzzle if you are trying to reduce emissions in Canada by 30% by 2030 or by 50 or 80% by mid-century. You would have to do something about this upward trend line in emissions. Uh, I'm just going to simplify it a little bit for you and just show you that there's three main areas of emissions. The blue at the top is livestock and manure, largely cattle. Uh, if you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to give you more detail in the Q&A session. Uh, the red bands near the middle are energy use of fuel, so the diesel fuel and gasoline used in tractors and trucks on the farm, farm machinery. Uh, also, natural buildings and water and uh, electricity used on farms. And the green bands at the bottom, that's nitrogen fertilizer. Well, there's a couple other things in there, but the vast majority of that green is nitrogen fertilizer. The light green area is nitrogen fertilizer production. You saw my Bill Brothers plant there a minute ago. And the dark green are the emissions when nitrogen is put onto the soil and one way or another ends up in the atmosphere largely as uh, nitrous oxide. So this puts numbers to those nitrogen figures. Uh, it, it was 21 million tons in 1990, now it's risen to 33 million tons. So remember, nitrogen fertilizer use is going bit like that. Uh, emissions. Are also going to look that. And 33 million tons is a big number. What does it mean? Well, that's about one and a half times the emissions from the entire province of Manitoba. So just the nitrogen fertilizer component of agriculture exceeds the emissions from 1.4 million people in Manitoba. So agriculture is a large source of emissions. Emissions are going up. And emissions are largely a product of input use. So I want to make the case now that there are going to be real limits on emissions moving forward. And that means we're going to have to rethink the way we produce food in Canada. We're going to talk a little bit about climate emergency. Most of you will remember the late 2015 Paris Climate Conference. That's where we got the agreement to pull global temperatures to two degrees. Uh, of one in this century and 1.5 degrees if possible. What's less well known about that conference is what happened in the lead up, and that is every country in the world submitted commitments to reduce emissions. Canada's commitment was a 30% reduction by 2030. The US committed something similar. European governments tended to have more ambitious commitments. And, but every nation in the world submitted a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So with these in hand, climate scientists at the UN and elsewhere, have, they had a question, and that is, if everyone reduces emissions as further commitments, will we be able to hold uh, warming to one and a half or two degrees? So they, they took all these emission reduction commitments and they fit them into their climate models or their computer models. They asked those climate models that question. And the answer that came back should really concern us, and that is, if we give every country in the world the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're all going to meet their emission reduction commitments, we're not on track to hold global temperature increases to one and a half degrees and two degrees. We're on track to hold, but we are on track for temperature increases of 3.2 degrees Celsius this century, far beyond the two degree so called danger line that's often trotted out. 3.2 degrees of warming would be a catastrophic amount of warming. Now, that's bad news for Earth, but it's even worse news for Canada and our food production system. Because continental interiors and northern latitudes are warming twice as fast as the Earth as a whole. We already see it in the, the temperature data. The central part of Canada, the prairies, the Peace River region of uh, BC, parts of Ontario, where a lot of our food is grown, they're already warming twice as fast as the Global average. So that means if the Earth is on track for 3.2 degrees warming, the Canadian food production area is on track for 6.4 degrees warming. That would be kind of it would 
call into question whether food production can even continue in certain parts of Canada. Now, that's a lot of bad news, but it doesn't have to come to pass. Um, we can make big changes and we can avert that and we can keep uh, warming much, much below those kind of numbers. But what it does tell us is that's the trap world. With the commitments we have, with the carbon taxes we've rolled out, with all the plans we have, we're still on track for that kind of warming. So it shows us that we have to make and meet much more ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. We need to up our game dramatically on this. Um, just a little whirlwind tour of some of the some of the long-term data. That's 800,000 years of CO2 emission, or sorry, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. It goes up and down, never exceeds 300 parts per million. It's now 400, it'll almost certainly get to 500. CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing 100 to 1,000 times faster than at any time in the last billion years. Uh, another one of the big greenhouse gases is methane. The primary contributor to methane is agriculture. That's a graph of 10,000 years of methane concentrations, 9,900 years of fairly stable concentrations, and 100 years we tripled them. So the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are going up, not surprisingly so are temperatures. This is a scatter plot from some uh, NASA data showing the temperatures over the last uh, 140 years. What was important there is the last 50 or 60. Temperatures go up about uh, 0.8 degrees to a degree. So we're already seeing significant warming and that warming is set to accelerate if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we've done something unusual in the last hundred years. We've changed agriculture. We've made a system that was for millennia, a low input system into a high input system and with those high inputs come high emissions. It's impoverished farmers and it now imperils the climate and the future. I want to end on a little bit more uh, optimistic note. We're, we're in a crisis, but a crisis creates the potential for opportunities and transformations. And the solutions begin to become apparent when you look at the really long term. And I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning. Humans have practiced agriculture for about 10,000 years. That's what 100 centuries. And for 99 centuries, it was solar powered, low input, and more or less zero emission. For just one century, for just 1% of the time that we practiced agriculture, it's been fossil fueled, high input, and high emission. So the, the first conclusion I want you to think about from this is, agriculture does not produce greenhouse gas emissions. Agricultural inputs produce greenhouse gas emissions. We have got 10, of millions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions coming out one end of our agricultural system because we're pushing millions of tons of fuel and fertilizer and pesticides and other potential industrial inputs into the other end. The emissions from agriculture are a function of the inputs that we stick in. So it's not agriculture that produces emissions, it is agricultural inputs. Humans have been farming for 10,000 years and we did not affect the climate. It's only in the last 100 years that we did. So the second conclusion I'd like you to think about from this is any low emission food system will be a low input food system. If you want to reduce emissions from your food system, you have to reduce the inputs going in. You have to reduce the fuel going in, the fertilizers going in, the chemical going in. So at that point, you realize that low input food systems, including organic, including mystic, including agroecology, all of these, they're not just good ideas of normal life. They start to become imperatives if we're going to maintain any kind of life and civilization on the planet. So we are thus on the eve of a massive transformation. We're really going to have to change this with everything about our farming and food systems in the first half of the 21st century. And that's daunting. But remember, we did it once already. We did it in the first half of the 20th century. When you think about the massive transformation between 1900 and 1950, just imagine what the world was like in 1900 and imagine it in 1950. In the first half of the 20th century, we replaced that solar-powered, low-input, zero-emission food system with 
the fossil fuel high emission system. In the first half of the 21st century, we're marginally going to have to accomplish the reverse. We're going to have to transform our food systems. And the good news is that will really help us uh, fix those problems I talked about at the beginning, the extraction of wealth by the input suppliers. It'll go a long way toward fixing the rural economy and toward our shared goals of rural capitalization. So just to conclude, because I'm running out of time and I want to time for questions, uh, we're at a historic turning point. Uh, the transformation of our farm and food systems really give us a last best chance to save the balance, to create low emission food systems, to wrest control of our farm and food systems away from the globally dominant uh, corporations, and to curb wealth extraction, stop the economic drain on rural economies, and really accomplish rural revitalization. And with that, I'll end up to say, uh, uh, my contact information is here. If you, you don't want to write it down, I can give a card at the end. Uh, my name is Darren Coleman, and uh, I've got a website, darrenholman.com, and I've got a book coming out, hopefully in February of 2019, called Civilization Critical, Energy, Food, Nature, and the Future. So uh, if you like some of the ideas I talked about here today, there's a lot more in that book. So thank you very much. Thank you.